Here we go with another time lapse. This is McGarren Flack, and I am just going to talk about this painting as I'm painting it. Well, not as I'm painting it, because it's time lapse. I recorded this earlier. Now I'm doing a voiceover over the time lapse of me painting this painting. Okay, so what I am working on is a substrate called alumalite. It's made with aluminum, and it has a corrugated plastic in the middle and then aluminum on the back side, and they have it already primed. Sign companies usually carry this material, and it makes it relatively lightweight but stable. So what I work on is this alumalite surface. I just sand it down so it's a matte-looking surface so I can paint on it, and so it has mechanical adhesion with the oil paint, and this is about 3 by 4 feet, somewhere around that size. And as I was starting out with this painting, you can see it looks pretty thin. What, the stage of this painting is what I would consider to be a poster study. I'm just trying to get some colors down on the canvas that are relatively close in value and relatively close in color. I'm not trying to nail it because I just want to see how the color harmony is between all the different colors that I'm throwing up on the canvas. I'm not throwing it up, but I'm placing it on the canvas. Anyways, so here I just am using a palette knife because the painting is so large. When I first started out, I was using a paintbrush for the sky, blue, and then it just wasn't getting enough paint on there. So I was using a palette knife to be able to really kind of trowel it on there. And this painting is based loosely, very loosely, on Thomas Moran's paintings. Thomas Moran was a phenomenal painter. In, in my opinion, I think he was actually, you know, he was one of the best landscape painters out there, bar none. I mean, Bierstadt was pretty darn good too, but Thomas Moran, he was kind of known as like a fantasy painter. He didn't actually paint the scenes of places where he was at. I mean, he did, but he kind of put together a view of one area and a view of another area and kind of put them all together into one singular view. And it's because of those paintings that we now have a lot of our national parks, especially out here in the West, is because of Thomas Moran. So I'm trying to do this painting reminiscent of his approach to value and color. Now, I don't think he painted the way that I'm currently painting, but I like this approach because it helps me kind of sneak up on the hue, value, and chroma of the painting as I'm working on it. The um, orientation of the video camera is vertical right now, but eventually I turn it horizontal here in a second. And so that's why I was using my phone to do the time lapse. And sometimes the exposures would work and sometimes the exposures wouldn't work. And sometimes the phone would work and sometimes it wouldn't. In total, this painting took me about, oh, I don't know, maybe, maybe 10 hours if I were to, maybe 12 hours to be able to paint the whole thing. But you can see right now I'm working on the second layer and the second layer is much cooler in value or cooler in color and cooler, darker in value slightly. Um, so that I get this color vibration between the background, the first layer and then the second layer. You can see now it's kind of jumped, so that's one of the parts where I missed the recording. But here I'm working on the mountain range off to the left-hand side. You can see the reference down to the left. I'm not using the reference exactly. I'm just using it as a reference to kind of see what is happening with the shapes and how the colors and values are changing. And I'm trying to express that in the painting that I'm doing. So this layer is relatively thin over the top of the base layer that I had initially put in there. And I'm using like transparent oxide red, transparent oxide yellow, a little bit of raw umber with white to put into those grays. I'm trying to get those little shadow areas that are being cast. And I'm trying to do it all directly, meaning trying to paint it in one sitting as opposed to doing a lot of indirect painting or painting in lots of different sittings on this current mountain range off to the left-hand side. And I'll do the same thing with the mountain mountain range, mountain range, mountain cliff, cliff side on the right hand side. But um, this left hand side, yeah, I'm, I'm really trying to get those forms accurate and softly turn the form as it goes towards the middle, a little bit of raking light that's going onto that wall. And I will paint the trees on a little bit later once I get everything figured out. Now here I go over to the right side 
you can see that the colors are totally different. It was kind of a greenish underneath, and now I'm putting in the complementary of a red, some transparent oxide red, transparent oxide yellow, uh, playing with the value, kind of changing the value, and I'm doing a, a scumbling type process. Hey, you should watch my video on scumbling if you haven't. Scumbling these colors over the top of my initial layer to get that feel of rock and get those nice uh, textural inconsistencies in rock. Now, one thing that I'm keeping in mind as I'm working on this, yes, the light that's coming in, I'm trying to keep my shadow values separate from my light values, but the tops of the rocks are perpendicular to the sky. So I'm going to make them a little bit cooler in color um, than the face of the rocks that are facing to the left or the right of the canvas. So the top facing of the rock that is perpendicular to the sky is going to be cooler or bluer than the face of the rock. And I, I try to simplify it in terms of shape and really kind of bring it home. Uh, think of it in terms of cylinders or squares or triangles. How can I create a more convincing face shape? I found that if I keep it monochromatic, it is not convincing. Don't want to paint everything with just the same red. I want to paint it with a red that's a little bit more orange, red that's a little bit more magenta. Speaking of red, when I shifted here into this major rock face that's in the center of the canvas, the reference had a certain look to it. And I was trying to capture that certain look. And I don't think I was very successful at doing it which is totally fine because I learned from my mistake. In fact, as I was working on this painting, and it doesn't happen until about, I don't know, nine or 10 minutes into the demo, I got really far and almost felt like I was completed or done. I sat there and had a conversation with Del Parson about it. And then a couple of students came by and we started talking about the painting. And that left side where there's that deep red that is contrasting against the light of the rock. It just looks too funky. And it's kind of repetitive to the right side of the canvas. So I didn't want that to feel that way. So I, I ended up changing it, which you'll see here in a little bit. But right now I am painting the parts of the rock that are not getting the ambient light from the sky. So think of it as kind of like the little shadow shapes or half tones that are facing the viewer and not facing the sky. So that way I have warm tones on the planes that are facing the viewer and cool tones on the planes that are facing the sky. I want to make sure I do that so that it looks convincing for the viewer when they're looking at the painting they're like, oh yeah, that looks like a mountainside. They d might not know why, but when I break it down into my mind, I, I try to analyze it in that way so that I can make a more convincing painting. So here I go adding some more texture with the palette knife. This is layer, I think, three in the foreground, and then it just jumps to the trees. So I did that third layer. My phone must have died, and then I came back in and started painting the green, the shrubbery, the brush, and the trees in the foreground a little bit more. I want to create some larger trees, give some contrast to the white of the rock or the gray of the rock, however you want to, whatever your preference is in calling that. And so I'm just simply blocking in these very simple shapes. I have larger shapes in the foreground. You can see my little head popping out in there and uh, the shapes get a little bit smaller as they go further back to the mountain range because I want to exaggerate the scale of this mountain. And the trees really help me exaggerate the scale of the mountain because I am painting them really small as they are on top of the mountain and really big as you get into the foreground. So due to the size of this painting and then also the relationship scale of the tree to the mountains, um, I feel like it was pretty convincing to make it look really big because it was a big mountain range. I also started with the shadow values. 
what I thought would be a good shadow value and then added the lighter values on top. And the lighter values are uh, like a sap green with yellow ochre and maybe a little bit of white to lighten up the values and to warm it up because not all the values are gonna be, or all the colors are gonna be cool. They'll be warm and cool because light is raking in on parts of the scene. That's one of the things I loved about Thomas Moran paintings. His ability to create form and have shadows and light, it was almost like you'd have a cloudy day, but not a cloud was in the sky, but it just had that feel or presence. If you ever go out to Washington, D.C., to the National Museum, they have a couple of really nice, large Thomas Moran paintings that are spectacular to look at. So here I'm just changing some of those colors and values in the green areas, the shrubs, the bushes, the dead branches, all that fun stuff, just to break up the shapes a little bit more. And then I go back in and I want to cool down those planes that are perpendicular to the sky so that it has this nice cool tone and brings a little bit more harmony into the painting. It was close to around this time that I was finishing up. Some of the students were sitting there watching me uh, paint this and I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm feeling good about it. I think I'm going to finish this up here and call it a day and just sign my name. But after having the conversation with students, they were like, mm, I don't know, maybe you should change that. That looks a little funky. And I agreed with them. I love the right side of the major part of the mountain, but I didn't love the left side. Del Parson recommended that I just leave it and not change it, which I totally understand. Part of me was like, well, yeah, what if I screw it up? Then the other part of me was all, well, yeah, what if I screw it up? That's totally fine. So anyways, I'm coming in here and making um, some changes in the face shape of all of these planes because I'm just not totally happy with it. So um, especially that little cutout of red that was sitting there, and now it's a little bit more of a yellow ochre. I think it reads a little bit better, but it's not done. So I, I kind of enjoy sitting here and watching the time lapse. It's interesting from a different point of view what I was working on or um, evaluating how I was working on the painting. And I sometimes even question myself when I'm working on these things. Like, what, what was I thinking when I was working on that? Or was I not thinking? And a lot of times I, I don't think when I'm working on my paintings. I'm trying to be very careful and observant when I first start to figure out where I'm going to place all of these various shapes and kind of like chess, how am I going to build up to win this painting? How am I going to build up texture? How am I going to build up the painting as a whole? Do I want to paint in the trees and then paint the rocks and stuff all around it? And with the painting this size, I don't think that would have been the best idea. So I decided to paint uh, from the background, moving more close towards the foreground. Then if I ever mess up things, I can just uh, go back in and, and make the changes or adjustment to whatever I need. Um, I think it's also interesting in terms of messing up a painting is it possible to mess up a painting? You better believe it is. At least in my opinion, I think it, it is. So many people are like, wow, but it's, it's such a great art piece. It's better than what I could ever do. And I hope that it's better than what I would be able to ever do. I hope every painting that I do is going to be better than the previous one. And the only way I feel like I can achieve that is by questioning everything that I do and also, um, doing what I fear. So if I fear changing something or fixing something, then I'm going to do it because I know it's going to be more beneficial for my painting. So I'd recommend if you're fearful in trying to do something, like physically do something, then you should probably give it a go. I mean, within reason. Some people are just crazy and say stupid things like, well, what about cutting your hand. I'm scared of cutting my hand. So does that mean that I should do it? No, of course not. But if you're working on a painting or something and you're afraid to try something new, do it. 
what, what do you have to lose? What if you mess it up? That's fine. You can mess it up, but you could always bring it back home. So here's where I go back in and I'm changing a lot of that mountainside and I'm trying to increase the chroma of the red of the hillside because I want to stick out in relationship to the blue sky. The sky itself is just a little bit too blue, but I'll make changes to that a little bit later. And then I come down and I start to change all the lighter faces in that left side of the rock area because um, that's after the conversation I had with students and Dell. It's always good to get feedback from other people too. Don't be afraid to hear what people have to say about your painting. It's awesome. I mean, you get to learn from the experience and you get to see what other people are possibly seeing. See here, I mean, I'm just taking a palette knife and throwing it on there and totally changing things up, softening things down, enhancing the contrast of some areas, making other areas a little bit more rough. I'm jumping around everywhere right now uh, because I am trying to establish harmony and continuity within the painting. So here I come, finishing out, almost done with this painting. Wanted to cut in a couple of other dark values, make those cliffs a little bit more interesting because that's the main part that I want people to look at. Um, I guess I didn't record the part where I painted the sky. and <laughs> it's You'll see it here as soon as I zoom out, which is totally good. I loved how the sky turned out, but I wish I would have been able to get it in the time lapse, but I didn't. So now you get the abbreviated time lapse version of it. Finishing up these rocks with a nice red, some pinks, some coral, a little bit of magenta in there, and some blues in those areas that the shadows are, um, or the, the clouds are covering up the sun from the sky. So just these little details. I would not recommend starting a painting this way. I know a lot of artists that will go in and start to paint the little trees and everything and everything around it, and it just would take you a very long time. And if you want to spend your time doing that, then more power to you. I don't want to. All right, here's the finishing. I signed my painting and that's basically it. I hope you enjoyed the time lapse and I hope you have an excellent day.